Now that the model is done and documentation is also complied, it's time to turn our attention to visual design, for which the most important basic uh, building block would be the perspective views. Up until to this point, we mostly worked in uh, axonometric mode. That's much better for working externally, working on architectural elements. But now we have to create views uh, where we can say where we are standing and what we are looking at. So in order to enter the perspective mode, we have to click on this eye icon up here. And when we do, uh, the whole viewpoint changes. So now we are uh, on the street level and we have this very nice preview over here, which shows you where you are standing and what you are looking at. So if you zoom in with the mouse wheel, you see that the that there's this uh, blue node. If you click on it, you can move it around so you can you can define where you are standing. And you can also define with this purple node what you are looking at. So this way you can uh, sort of fine tune uh, what you want to show to your clients uh, about your model. So let's uh, define a few uh, perspectives. First, we are going to do uh, an overview. We are going to face the, the model, which we can do by uh, moving the blue node somewhere here. And let's say that the, that the purple node would be somewhere there. So now we are looking at, at the whole model from a street level and we are facing the model. So we are satisfied with this view, but now we have to save it for further use, which you can do by the green plus icon. And when I click on that, I see that there's a new view created but I'd rather uh, name this somehow. So I'm just going to uh, double click on it and let's name it, uh, it's going to be overview front, like so. And let's just hit okay. So now we have this, this one view uh, selected or created. Let's carry on, let's carry a few other uh, views. Uh, we need one which shows the model from the, from the left hand side. So we are going to zoom in again and move the node, let's say here, because we are going to, this is the building which is in our focal point, so we are going to put that in, in the foreground and the rest of the building is, is in the background. So we are going to, again, click on the plus icon and create another uh, naming for it. This would be, uh, I think this should be street from uh, left, maybe. From, sorry, from left. All right. So we have two new views and we have to create another one and that will be the, um, the backyard, I think. So we have a couple of uh, pieces of content over there. So if we move the, the perspective, right? So uh, I think this one is almost good. So we are just going to move it like so. And clicking on the plus icon, I can, uh, I can just double click and, uh, and name it somehow. Let's say I want to name it backyard. Here we go. All right, so question is, how do we navigate between the, the views? Let's, let's hit okay. So one way to do it is that you click on this eye icon and then you have the, the views here. So you can just click on the views and you can toggle back and forth what you're looking at. Uh, that's one way to do it. The other way is uh, using the, these uh, up and down keys when you are in the 3D. So you can just click on the arrows and then you, it just takes you where you need to be. And there's also the page up, page down key. So this works similarly when you are navigating between floors. At this time, we are going to use the page up and page down keys to navigate between the views. Uh, another thing you need to know, and I haven't talked about this before, is the logic behind how the views are organized. Because if I click back on the eye icon, I see that these views are, are basically uh, not stored in the order in which they were created but they are in alphabetical order. So if you want to organize your views, it's always good to add in some numbers or, or letters. So let's learn a, a good practice for that. Let's decide what will be the first uh, view that we want to show when we are opening the project. Let's say that this would be street from left. So all you have to do is just add in numbers. So this would be zero, one, street from left. Uh, what should be the second one? I think the overview from front would be the next one. So I'm just going to name this. Again, you could do this when you are creating the views, but later on you can do that too. And then we need the, the backyard, that would be 03. And the two, two inside views, the living room one and two, we're also naming them. Uh, and this way, this way you can control the order in which the views are going to appear. Here we go, let's do the last one. This will be 05 and we're good to go. So again, quick refresher if you want to move back and forth between the views. I personally prefer to use the page up and page down keys. Now that the perspectives are done, it's time to look at shadows, how they are going to affect the, the building. 
but we don't see any shadows. So how do we turn them on in the first place? If we go to the view toolbar over here and click on shadows, you can ask the shadows to be turned on. Uh, when it comes to shadows, there are two kinds of representations. Uh, and when I say representations, I mainly think about the 3D editing space, because if you are going to create a rendering, you would, you would have, of course, much nicer and, and more elaborate shadows. But when you are just working, you're just modeling, you don't need the elaborate shadows. So in, this, in these cases, the software simplifies how the shadows look like, just represent where the shadows would be. Now, if you want to fine tune how the shadows look like, you can go to the property grid. And here you have a choice between uh, soft and hard shadows. Now we have a soft shadow. A soft shadow is the least uh, artsy, uh, but, uh, but fastest way to create a shadow. Because this, to calculate the shadows now, the software doesn't take too much processing power. If you click on hard shadows, the result is a bit better, uh, more accurate, but processing this might take a larger toll on your CPU. So let's go back to back to soft shadows. That's what we are going to work on now. One problem that we see, one issue that we see over here is that the building is in, in shadows completely because the sun is shining from the back. This is because of the geolocation and, and because of the north direction. So that's the sun is at this time of the day. But if you want to create, um, how should I say, a result which might not be accurate, but it looks good, you can temporarily move the sun out of its place. You can move it anywhere you want. Uh, again, that would not give you an accurate result because you are manipulating nature, essentially, but it, it gives you the right result uh, in terms of looks. So you can do that by going into sun and clicking on Heliodon. And if you do that, you have two main controls you can use. One is uh, where the sun rises and sets, so you can just click on this node and move it somewhere else. Let's, let's move it like so. So now the, the sun is going to face the building, so that's, that's one control you can use. And the other one is, is how high the sun is in the sky. So you can just say that, let's say the sun is, uh, is like so. So it gives you the, the, the right result, but again, it might not be accurate. Uh, but if you want to take a few pictures like this, you can do that, you can create, create some renderings. Mind you, if you create renderings, the result in terms of shadows would be much nicer. Now, but if you want to go with the original uh, sun settings to keep accuracy, and you want to find another time of the day to sort of give a better look to your model, then you can go to shadow and go to, I'm sorry, uh, go to uh, shadow simulation. And here you can fine tune the time of the day and the date. Uh, let's move this window out of the way so that way you can see where the sun is moving. Uh, and let's say we want to find another time, which would be, I think, 11, 11-ish, would be fine. And the date should be, I think, April would be fine, like the, towards the uh, end of April. And we are going to find another uh, perspective. I think the one which is, uh, which is, um, Looking at the building from the from the street, like so, would be fine. Again, if you want to create a, a better uh, shadow representation, you can go and go with the uh, hard shadows. Again, this gives you a, a better result. And just to just refresh, if you want to again move the sun, you can do that uh, with these sliders, so you can find a better sort of uh, shadow representation to your model. So again. Setting up the right sun position is going to ensure that your model would be, or renders would be uh, better looking, but you have the ability using the Heliodon to alter reality and temporarily move the sun in places where it might not necessarily be. We have talked about uh, natural lights. We set up the sun position, we looked at shadows, but one thing is missing from this whole equation is artificial lights lamps and light sources. Now, of course, since you are going to create uh, rendered images, uh, Arshine does have lamps and light sources as well. But let's clarify the difference between the two concepts. So let's start first with light sources. Now, a light source is, is basically an entity which is casting light on your model, which, would, uh, which you would see the result of in rendering. And these light sources can be assigned to objects, which we are calling lamps. Now, this whole difference uh, between the two is important because 
just having a lamp without a light source is just an object. But if you have any kind of object and you add a light source to it, then you have a body, uh, an object which is which is actually giving light to your model, and the result would be uh, would be very much visible in rendering. Now, uh, there are many many different light sources in the software. If you want to add your own, then you are able to import them in a sort of called a IES format. Now, without going too much into the details, IES light source is basically a very faithful representation of the light casting abilities of of a, of, a, of a light bulb and you can import that from different manufacturer libraries. We're not doing that now, but you need to know how that works. Now, let's assume that we want to add uh, a lamp over here, uh, just below this kind of uh, roof. How do we do that? We go to the, uh, the object library of our software, and here we have a folder what we call uh, lighting. There we go, and here we have different uh, categories based on where these light uh, casting elements, these lamps are stored. You can categorize them based on where they are coming from. For example, they are coming from the 3D warehouse or they are main, mainly ceiling mounted or wall mounted, etc. cetera. Uh, let's look at an example. We are looking for a ceiling light and I think this, this ceiling light number three would be fine. Now, uh, if you open up with a double click the properties of this lamp, uh, there are several things that you need to see in order to understand that these are these are actually lamps, not just plain uh, bodies. One of the things that tell the telltale signs that this is a lamp is this light bulb. If it has this light bulb icon, it means that this is not only an object, but it also has a light source in it. Now, um, here you have a preview of the of the object, and just clicking OK, now you are able to place the element onto a surface. Now, in Arch9, you are able to snap elements, uh, especially lamps and these kind of elements, onto horizontal and vertical surfaces. That's one way to place an object. The other way would be, let's just hit escape to terminate this command, is just to click on this object and drag and drop onto the surface. So let's say I want to position it here. Uh, with another escape, I can uh, close this command and I can uh, select my lamp to see what it, what it does, how, what makes it, it a lamp. Just to compare, if I select any other element, for example, I select this, uh, this column, I do not see this light bulb, but if I select the lamp itself, I see the light bulb over there. Now, why is that actually important? That's because when you, when you select the lamp, you have uh, options to edit the lamp itself and the light source separately. You can uh, have access to the light source on two different levels. One is to use this drop down list, and here you can toggle to the light source. Or if you have the lamp selected, you can just click on this, uh, this light bulb and then you have the same, uh, same option. Now here you have the properties of the light source. So these are predefined, these you cannot change, but you can define other things. For example, if the light is turned on and off and if you want to add any kind of dimming level. So you are going to see later on on rendering how this, uh, this object works in reality. So how, how it's going to cast light. Uh, one thing what you might not need to do, but uh, in my case, I'm going to. Um, whenever I play something in the 3D, I try to be as accurate as possible, but sometimes I, I'm a little bit off. So in these cases, I leave the 3D behind and I highlight the 2D and try to see if the position of this light is actually okay. Now, not so much. Uh, maybe I want to move it a little bit further to the side so it aligns with the middle of this, uh, of this object. So what I can do, I can just uh, click on the move marker and I try to find the reference point over here so then I can just place it in a much, much nicer position. I think this is a bit better for my purposes. So in a nutshell, uh, this is how you place lamps with light sources and in, the, in rendering you are going to see how they look like when they are in action. It's quite important to note that uh, even without doing any rendering, you can still uh, show your clients how your work looks like. You can create a snapshot of the 3D model that you're currently working on. Uh, before we create a, a snapshot, we need to decide how we want to show this model. So what is the kind of color scheme in which we want to portray it? Uh, let's find another view. I, uh, I can use the page up, page down keys to find something which is better fitting my purposes. I think I need the, the outside, this kind of over view of the, of the street. And if you want to understand how your model can be shown, even without being rendered, you need to get uh, here into this uh, settings of the, of the 3D model representation. Now, there are several options here. For example, you can go with this hidden line removal, kind of like a paper model feel of the, of the model. Note that this doesn't delete any textures, it just shows the model in a different way. 
Uh, you can also go with a, with a colored or a, or a realistic uh, sort of like uh, outlook. Uh, one thing you need to know is that uh, the real realistic uh, representation, for example, is a bit of a tricky thing because it tries to replicate the effect that things which have the same color might not look the same uh, on different uh, circumstances. For example, if uh, if you have this, this texture, this kind of uh, grayish texture uh, applied to the underside of a slab, it might look a bit darker than it actually is. So if you want to make sure that your clients understand how the colors actually look like, uh, or how they are actually behaving, then you might go, need to go with uh, the consistent color option, which is what I use all the time. So in this scenario, no matter how the model is is uh, is portrayed or, or moved, the colors are always look the same. So that's that's one uh, trick of what uh, what I always use. Once we have set up the right representation style, again we are going to use consistent color, uh, and again we reset the view to the one that we need. Uh, we can create a snapshot, which we can do under documentation snapshot. Let's go to the drop down, and let's say that I want to create a snapshot of the 3D view. Uh, here you can uh, decide what the size of the image could be. Uh, the value what you see here is the horizontal size. So this, these are the current number of, of pixels which are here horizontally and you know, vertically it should be what we have here. You can change that of course and you can change the, the, uh, the file extension as well. So if you want to change another uh, into another file format, you can do that. And here you can either place this snapshot onto the 2D uh, to use it, for example, on your plot layouts, or you can save it and send it to your clients. So if I hit save, uh, then I see that I already uh, did that before. So I have uh, one version of the image here, but let's, let's say I have another version over here. So this could be tutorial 04. And then I can just save this image and send it to my clients uh, via email or via any other means. I just opened up a file browser to see the image that I created. So here's the here's the uh, image that I, I just took a snapshot of uh, in the resolution I wanted. So now I could uh, you know send this image to my clients, upload to the cloud, uh, or I can I can use it in any other ways to sort of keep the clients up to date on my work. When our students uh, are asking us uh, what makes a render looking realistic. We always say that there are two things you have to figure out. Uh, one is, is lights and the other one is materials. Now lights we have already tackled with the sun and the artificial lights. And now we have to talk about materials. What makes them look realistic? Uh, what we are going to do, we are going to work on the backyard and I'm going to show you in a few examples how to fine tune your materials. Now, uh, first of all, let's find the view that we need in this case. Uh, I think that that is going to be the, the backyard. And here we see that there's a couple of things already taken care of. So I have a nice wooden deck over here. I have some wooden uh, sort of uh, sun chairs and some other elements here. How can I be sure that these are going to behave the way I want them to behave on a, on a render? Now for this, we have a special tool in the software. We call it render styles. Now, if I click on the render styles, then I see that there are a couple of previews these thumbnails and this might make you think that these are materials or textures that we have here, but they are not. They're actually functions. So you can assign these functions onto surfaces and then these functions would dictate how these surfaces would behave. Let's illustrate. For example, I have this nice uh, wooden deck over here and I have a corresponding uh, wood material or not material, render style in this, in this palette. So I can just grab onto it and apply it onto the surface. If I click on it, I see that, well, actually, you know, I'm clicking, but nothing is happening. But this is because uh, this would not change the material. Instead, it would change the way it's going to look like in rendering. Let's continue and later on you will see what I mean. Let's zoom in and let's click now on the, on the uh, windows as well. You don't have to click on all the windows because this would change the behavior of the material in all the instances. Let's continue. I'm going to terminate this with, with an escape and click on wall and I'm going to apply it onto the wall surfaces. Make sure that all the surfaces behave the same way. Uh, going back to Vuda, I think I haven't done these, uh, these chairs uh, yet. Again, there's this nice uh, ladder over here for which I'm going to give maybe a metallic but rather a chrome surface. Here we go. 
So you see, whenever you click, nothing is really happening. Nothing seemingly is happening, but you will see later on. For example, if you, if you talk about water, uh, you, th you think that these would look nice on the rendering, but you can add additional um, properties to it using the, the water uh, function. And when you place it, you see that now actually something is happening. The texture is not changed, but it's becoming a bit transparent, which would look very nice on rendering. Another thing you need to know if you, if you are assigning these render styles and you move the mouse cursor onto, onto surfaces, then you see a preview, this kind of uh, tooltip to show you what are the current sort of functions of these, of these uh, surfaces. So it's, it tells you uh, all, the, all the properties you need to know. So when you are in the, in the mode of adding render styles, you already see what is the sort of function of these elements, which is already assigned. Now, how do you keep track of all the surfaces? How do you know which have been applied render style with or which are the ones that you haven't worked on? For this, we have this color coding. So every single render style has this kind of uh, color thumb, uh, thumbnail or this kind of index. For example, this, uh, this uh, glossy covering has this pinkish rectangle, etc., etc. And if you are going to click on this color coded view, then it tells you, uh, it switches the view into this kind of uh, preview to show you which are the surfaces that have render styles and what kind of styles they have. So for example, this way you can understand that the walls have applied to these surfaces and glass have applied to these particular surfaces. So this is a good way to track if maybe you have forgotten about something. Uh, for example, maybe I want to change the rain gutter to something metallic. So I'm just going to click on the on this and apply the different render styles. So this way you can make sure that you're not missing on anything. In fact, it's better to have this, uh, this color coded uh, view turned on when you are editing the, the materials. Otherwise, you might get into a situation when you are missing something. Maybe this column should have a wall style as well. So I'm just going to add it like so. So in a nutshell, uh, you can go back to the original view like so. Uh, sorry, restore. Uh, seeing nothing is happening, but you are changing the function of the materials, which would look, uh, which would give you a very nice uh, end result in rendering. You might have already noticed that there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the model that I'm creating and the models that my uh, fellow designers have created. Let's uh, go outside and see what, what I mean. Uh, you can see here that there's a very special like brick material applied to the to this uh, elevation of the building, but I don't have this on my end. So I, I need, to, need to change these parts and also on the side, I need to change the material to something else. So let's zoom in and see how it's done. There are more than one ways to change materials for an element. I'm going to show you one, but I'm going to show you other ways as well as we go on. So uh, select a ball that you want to change and you need to disable the setting which will dictate that the inside and the outside of the ball should have the same material. So let's disable that and go with the exterior settings. And we are going to uh, use this brick six because that's the one that others, uh, others have used on the, on the rest of the building. So I'm just going to hit OK and it is changed similar way. I'm just going to uh, switch to the other wall. Again, disable the, uh, the same material setting and the exterior is going to change, be changed to uh, brick number six. Now, uh, this might be a bit cumbersome if you have more than one wall, uh, as is the case now. So we are just going to go out here and I'm going to show you how to do it in, uh, in more than, well, in one step for more than one wall. So I'm going to click on one of the walls I want to change. And I'm going to uh, hit uh, control and while navigate, hit control again. And now I have more than one wall selected. So again, I'm just going to go same material disabled, finish face exterior is going to be brick. So there you go. And we go to this, uh, to the ground floor again, uh, select the walls, release the control button, uh, move to the other side of the building. And again, control again. And here, disable this and go with brick six. So this way, uh, let's just find a view which, which would show us better what we need. Uh, I think the outside is now should be okay. Uh, one thing is missing is this, uh, is this column. So I'm going to uh, repair them as well. For this, I'm going to show you a trick, a shortcut if you like. Uh, for example, if you want to copy paste this uh, material onto the, onto the columns, then you can just highlight the surface and you just say, uh, find material. And then you can just drag and drop this material onto the surface and you can just say that replace with this material uh, with another on this object once and twice. And this way you can just uh, easily 
change anything uh, that you want in terms of materials. Uh, I'm not sure about the render style, so let's just do some refreshing and see if these materials have the right render style. So I'm just going to go back to the main selector, go render styles, let's do color coded. And I see that this is not uh, not the one I need. So this has this kind of mate, uh, material, but it's at least it's consistent. So later on we can change that. I just wanted to make sure that it looks the same. I think this is this is good. So let's proceed. We did talk about materials already, but the question is, how do you get your own custom new materials into the software. Now, of course, you can use your uh, use our own library here, but if you want to create your own things, then you can just click on the cogwheel over here and click on create new material. Uh, where you can, uh, you are introduced to this, uh, to this dialogue where you can name your material and you can use an image, an existing image, to create something new. Now, when I say image, uh, it means that these images could come from any other, any sources. You can get it from, a, from an online library, you can get it from your uh, own collection of JPEGs or PNGs. Uh, let's see the scenario when you find something nice online and you want to use it in the software. You want to use it on this building. Uh, let's open up the browser. Uh, there are tons of websites with downloadable content. Some of them are free, some of them are paid. But one thing what we recommend is this polyhaven.com, which has a couple of very nice high resolution uh, materials free to download. And the one we are using is this beige ball 001. Uh, let's select it and if you click on this button over here you have several options of what which version you want to download this uh, material off we are going to go with diffuse uh, jpeg now if i click on that i have the image loaded up in a separate tab in my browser and if i hit right click i can just save the image to my local folders and then i can read that into archline let's see how that works i'm not saving that now because i already did that but if i go back to to archline we go uh, and I click on uh, browse, then I can see the content that I already uh, downloaded, click on it, hit open, and then the, the new material would load up here and also in the preview. And another thing, uh, the name would be defaultly filled up with the new materials name. Now, next thing I could do, I could categorize the, the material. So I can say that this is uh, something belonging to, to buildings and the subcategory would be, I think it should be uh, maybe plaster, it would be fine. Producer, I don't really know. So I'm going to use it as it is. Let's look at the tabs that we have here. Let's start first with physical uh, properties. The physical properties will tell you how big this material is. What is the, what is the repetition size? So for example, if this is 500 times 500 millimeters, then that's the, that's the, the, the size of the sample, which would be repeated uh, based, on, uh, based on this setting. So if you have a 500 times 500 uh, size for this, then that's the, that's the size of the material. Uh, this is not that visible now because this, is, this looks like a solid color, but if you have some kind of pattern in it, then that would be the repetition of that pattern. Let's go, in with, uh, let's go on with appearance. Here we have a very familiar thing, the render style. If we click the drop down, then I can set this to all. And then I can make sure that all the properties would be added to this, to this material. And here's where the render style becomes interesting because there are all kinds of sliders here. You can control the transparency, brightness, uh, reflection of this material. Of course you can do that by hand, but if you, if you work based on render styles, these settings will be done on your behalf. You don't have to care about that. And you see in this nice preview how this material would look like. Thermal parameters, we are not uh, changing that. Hatching 3D and hatching section are the selectors which would govern how this material would look like on uh, any kind of section drawings, detail drawings. So if you want to set up a nice hatch pattern for this material, then you can do that over here. This is just a slight detour. We did that before, but you at least you know where to find it. So, okay, let's, uh, let's hit okay. And now if uh, I don't have to find the material because it's already selected in my, uh, in my material library, and I can use that material to change some existing elements on my model. What I'm going to change is this part of the model, this uh, facade over here and there, this brick six, I ended up not liking eventually, so I'm going to change it to something new. So what I do, I just click on the material, drag it and drop it and say that I want to replace this material with another on all instances. If I click on it, I see that, uh, yes, it's going to be replaced, but actually not on all instances. And uh, why is that? This is because this part of the model was actually linked from another model. So this is not something that I can edit. This is not something that I can change. 
because the, this part of the work still belongs to my fellow designers. So if he changes the original model, then I can update these changes over here. Uh, now, having looked around, I see that there, there's one thing I forgot to do, and that's uh, changing this column. So I'm just going to drag and drop this material over here, and I'm just going to do that. So this way you can easily find new content, new materials on online libraries or from any other sources. You can add them to the software and you can change existing elements to these materials. Make sure you set up the right render style, by the way. This method of working that I just showed you that finding a material, replacing everything with it is, uh, is effective, but a bit uh, destructive. So there's no easy way to jump back to earlier versions. You have to redo everything. And in order to avoid that, I'm going to teach you how to use color cards. Now, what color cards do is that they, they take a color scheme and replace it with something else. So you have, for example, one material and you can replace all instances with it uh, all instances of it with another another color, another texture, and then you can have another version and another version. Uh, this is a very effective way of uh, having a talk with your clients and try different versions of, of a color scheme. How does that work? So I think it's best, best uh, illustrated in action. So what we do is that we have the material that we already have here uh, selected, and let's assume that this would be only one version of the facade that I want to try, but I want to have two other versions as well. So I'm going to click on this cogwheel and I say create a copy as a color card. Now I'm, I'm going to hit yes and here I have the ability to, first of all, let's, let's name it. Let's, uh, let's name it uh, wall coloring and uh, I need to add another material to this list which would be an alternative to this beige wall uh, coloring. So clicking on this uh, green plus I can uh, browse for another element maybe something from the model, let's say bricks number six, because what if I want to you know, try the original version? So let's add that and let's add another one, uh, which would be, I think this, we are looking for something like, like a stone ballish uh, color, like so. And uh, let's hit, uh, before I hit OK actually, uh, I have uh, the option here to select one of the materials, which would be the default one to this color card. Let's choose uh, brick six. And let's hit OK. When I do, something changes here in this, uh, in the uh, in the project content uh, uh, holder here. I have a wall coloring uh, color card with the default brick number six setup. How does this work? How do I use this on on this wall segment? Well, you just have to uh, click on it, drag it, and drop it onto the surface. And you have to choose select one material with another uh, on all instances. And here you, you can select, okay, which uh, material you want to replace it with. Let's go with brick number six. And here you go, now you have replaced all instances with the original brick number six version without losing the original color. You can revert back to that, I'll show you how. So you right click on the, on the wall and you say that you want to, want to find the, the color card over here. And here now, if I click on the, on the versions, let's just move this out of the way. Uh, click on the members of the or the items of this color card i can try different versions of this uh, of this facade so maybe you want to go back to the original brick number six maybe you want to go with the beige or maybe with this with the stone version the point is that if you are creating rendering uh, the rendering will always show the current setting of the color card so if you go back to the original brick six then this is what you are going to create the the rendering uh, the rendering based on this. So the rendering would always reflect what you have set up here. So just to sum up, color card is a very uh, effective way of trying different versions of the same items, uh, different color schemes, very good way to communicate with your clients. So let's get cracking, let's create our first renderings. Uh, for those of you who are more technical minded uh, than I am, the, we are going to use a component which is a CPU renderer. So it's going to mainly use your uh, computer's processor. And the thing is that this is a bit demanding on your computer. So if you are doing renderings, uh, then make sure you're not doing anything as demanding because otherwise the rendering process would be longer than expected. Uh, by the way, if you want to check on this, for, again, for the technical minded, we are using a rendering engine which is manufactured by the French company Redway. Now, Rendering is all uh, handled here under view and in this, uh, in this dialog or in this drop down list. Uh, we have several choices here. Mainly we have standalone and integrated and two for each. One, a one is a final render, the other one is a, is a draft. 
Draft is what you would be using if you are still not finished with your work and you don't want to waste too much time on rendering yet because you are not really sure if you are done modeling uh, at all. Uh, standalone would give you a window that you would be able to move to another screen or use even if you close arch lines. So if you want to use, uh, if you want to create a rendering which would be running in the background while you are doing other things, standalone rendering would be the way to go. You can either go for a final render or with a real time draft. And the same thing is repeated here with an integrated mode. The integrated would mean that you have a, a window running within arch lines. So this would show you all the things that you do. So every time you do something, uh, then, uh, then the changes would be updated in the rendering. But what is it exactly that we are rendering? Uh, let's go back to the model. Uh, you can render anything you see in the 3D, so any arbitrary view, let's say for example this, but I personally always like to use a, a predefined view because then you can be sure that you can track back to this very same view and you could have, for example, multiple versions of the same view and then you can compare them. The next question that I could be asking is, what is the size of what we are going to render? Or better yet, what is the size that I actually see of this, of this image? Because you, know, you, can, you can magnify this window any way you want. Uh, how am I to know what is, this, what is the size or, or what is the, the boundary of my vision? Now, if you go back to rendering, you can turn on and off this render frame. Uh, let's click on it. Now, seemingly nothing is happening, but that's only because the view is currently smaller than what the render, uh, the, the render frame allows me to see. Let's put this into, uh, into a larger view and I still don't see the edge of it. So let's just unpin the project navigator. Uh, and now I see these things over on the side here and over here. This shows that the content that is on the left hand side of this dashed line and same here to the right hand side is not going to be part of what I'm rendering. So that, that is okay. This is just for you to know that this is what the, what the, where the edge of your image would be. Now let's open up the rendering window and see what kind of settings we have over there. Let's go to rendering and this time we are going to do a standalone rendering in a real time draft. Real time draft is a good way to make sure that every time you do some change on your model, uh, the change will be updated couple of settings over here, let's go through them. Now, the advantage of a real-time draft is that the, the fact that it's draft, it's going to be very quick, but not too high in terms of quality. So it might be a bit grainy, but it gets the job done. It tells you uh, the things that you want to see at this point. For this reason, I don't recommend to, to crank up the resolution. Let's, uh, let's keep it as it is. I think this would be good enough for our purposes. And again, the render preset will be a real-time draft. We are not changing that one. Visualizing the light sources would mean that every time you have a light source on your model, it would add a tiny light bulb onto the image, which might be okay if you want to create like a lighting plan, but at this time we are not going to ask for the light sources to be visualized. We need to enable artificial lights, which in this case we mean the lamps, so we need to uh, enable them. And uh, we have a couple of presets in terms of sunlight. We are going to use a clear daylight. I think that's, that's uh, good enough. Sun intensity, we could crank it up, but I think at this point we, we are okay with that. Bump mapping would govern the, the roughness, the, the lifelikeness of the materials. We are going to see later on how that's relevant. And you can uh, have a customized uh, background image. Now, what you can do is that you can either go with, a, with an image, uh, which you can browse from your computer, or you can download from a website, uh, but I like to use a panorama because if you do use a panorama, then wherever you turn in your 3D, you would always uh, see a very nice, F, you know, all covering uh, background. Now we have a couple of panoramas in a uh, preset in the software, uh, with some hills in the distance, sunny plain, etc. And you can always download one from other websites. So if you have one in a in a in the right format, then you can uh, you can load that up. Uh, there are some other settings over here, but at this point, I always like to just, you know, just get things going, start rendering, and later on you can figure out the details, and that's what we are doing now. Let's hit start rendering. Now, what is happening here is that the software is bounding up the 3D model and passes it onto the, the rendering engine. And then after a little bit of processing, the result would, uh, would appear in front of our eyes. And the important thing is that the result here would not be that spect spectacular at this point. But that's fine. We don't need final results. We need a draft. We need to see if the shadows are okay, if the if the materials are, are looking nice. So we see one preliminary uh, example over here. So this is how my model should look like if I do a final rendering. Uh, and uh, this will be a very solid foundation of, uh, of my further work.
the render draft is you know by definition is a draft so it might not be it could be far from being perfect if i uh, zoom in i see that reflections are might might not be okay uh, it could be better uh, it could be of a higher resolution but it gets you a very clear understanding of how your model behaves at the moment based on the current material settings and, and visual settings so uh, of course you can fine tune the details here and you can uh, you can do all kinds of uh, editing but you don't need to because at this point this is just only to show you how with your current settings uh, the model would uh, would look like uh, you can go to details of course and you can you can crank up from a real time draft to uh, to a full all out uh, all out rendering but we don't need to do that because we need to still edit a few things uh, then you might be asking okay if i have to do this again why do i need to work why do i need to know the draft at all now one huge advantage and, and strong point of the draft is that if you do any kind of change in your model then those changes will be reflected here not only that but if you move the camera those changes are tracked here too so if i go back to archland and i move a bit closer move a bit closer to the entrance and i look upwards like like so for example and if i go back to the rendering window i see that the changes that the this kind of changes in terms of uh, viewpoint are automatically tracked so every time you move around let's just show, show you that so if i go to another view i just jump back into the again if you have another screen you can just move this window to the other screen and then you can just uh, leave it there. So every time you do some kind of change, then uh, then the that the draft would reflect those changes. Okay, so at this point, we are just going to stop this rendering and we are going to discard this so we don't need to uh, save this image. Uh, the software asks us if you want to do in case you want to keep a copy of this, but we are not going to uh, keep that. And we are going to move on to a final rendering. For the final render, I think I'm again uh, going to use another view. Uh, maybe the one on the street and uh, well the process is a bit similar with some minor uh, differences if you go to rendering and you go to standalone rendering we almost see the same menu with some some things of uh, worth noting uh, resolution we are not changing but here we have render presets and here we have a couple of uh, uh, numbers and, and letters to sort of code you uh, which which presets could be used in which scenarios we are going to use uh, A01 uh, to A03 and these are the presets that you could be using on, on exterior models and which one you should be using is the question that you would be asking. Well, first we are always starting with, with a quick render that will get the job done but uh, depending on how many light sources, how many surfaces, how many materials you have, uh, this might not get you the right results. Maybe there would be some, some graininess. Uh, and if that happens, you can go a bit uh, higher. So these are actually um, in terms of uh, how high the quality of the end result would be. So we start with the lowest one and we are keep on going until we hit the right mark. D you should be asking, uh, okay, why don't we start with the, with the highest uh, resolution or highest quality? Well, you could, but maybe you don't need that at the moment. Maybe you don't want to spend too much time on this. Maybe you want to see which stages which gets the job done for you the best. So let's start with the A01 and I'm not going to change any other uh, presets. I'm going to start rendering. And again, the same thing happens as before. The software is going to uh, bundle up the whole model, uh, the whole 3D model and it passes it onto rendering. And now the process takes a bit, uh, bit longer, but the result will be much better than the draft. Uh, so once, we, once the rendering actually starts processing the 3d model we see the same thing as we saw before only at, even at this time we see that it's it's much less grainy the uh, reflections are better uh, but there would be some difficult parts which we need to take care of and that we can do with a higher uh, higher setting so what we can do is that we can wait for the rendering to run to the end and then we can save the image and then we can say, uh, send it to clients or maybe uh, copy to a hard drive or paste it back onto a plot layout you see that the rendering in a final uh, quality setting takes uh, a lot more than creating a draft render. Uh, but even before you are finished with rendering the final result, you see that there's a couple of things uh, what you can do. Let's just first zoom in and see how the quality is being cleared up as we speak. So we see that things are getting, uh, getting sharper uh, edges. So the result is coming along nicely. Uh, and if you go to the effects, there's a couple of sliders based on which you can fine tune the end result even before the end result is created. So let's see how these sliders work.
Now that the rendering ran all the way until the end, I can uh, save the image to my hard drive, or I could use the sliders to boost the end result. Let's get familiar with what the sliders can do because they can do wonders with the, with the result here. First, let's start with exposure. Uh, we could go top to bottom from brightness, but exposure is the thing that you would take care of first. Uh, if you go high, then the, the, the scene might get a bit burnt out. And if you go to the lower levels, then everything gets a bit darker because this works a bit like when you have a professional camera and manually set up the exposure to have more, uh, to have the film exposed to more sunlight. So actually exposure and brightness could go hand in hand because the two uh, handled together would give you the right result. Brightness is uh, is working in this concept. It's going to make every single one of the one of the pixels look uh, look brighter. So if you crank it up, then things get a bit faded, and if you go uh, down, then things get darker. So what we always recommend is to sort of try to, to use the the two the brightness and the exposure you know going hand in hand. Try to find the, the golden middle. I think the exposure would be fine, maybe if the brightness would be uh, cranked up a little bit. I think this is, uh, this is getting better. Uh, we could go back to these settings later on as, if we want to. The, uh, the setting over here is, is contrast. This makes, uh, now that I look at it, I think I need to crank up the brightness a bit more. It looks good on the big screen, on the smaller screen it looks a bit... Uh, bit too dark, but we can we can go back to that later on. Okay, so uh, talking about contrast, again, you could go crazy with this setting, so you can say that everything is a bit, you know, faded and, and grainy, or you can go all the way up. Uh, the point is that if you ever get lost, if you don't know how to reset the setting back to the original one, you can just click on the button over here, and that would crank the, the value that you are setting uh, back to the original uh, setup. Now, talking of saturation, uh, this would handle the colors. So if you want to wash out the whole thing uh, and you want to uh, create like a black and white version of your model, you can do that. Uh, but if you go into the other direction, the result would be a bit, uh, bit of a cartoonish, sort of like, uh, like this, this crazy uh, inverted uh, light color. So let's just click on it to, to go back to the original one. Uh, about shadows, uh, this would boost the shadows that you have here, but if you crank it too much, then the dark areas would be a bit too dark. So it would look like uh, this model is uh, suffering for hangover. So let's just click back on it. Uh, if we, here we have, uh, here we have uh, two settings which would go hand in hand. The, we have the, the midtones and the highlights. Again, uh, this would, uh, if you modify them too much, then the result would be a bit uh, faded or, or too, uh, too, too extra, if I, if I can say that. But you can use them if you want to give a very uh, special Outlook, uh, white balance would, would shift the whole model or the whole picture into a bluish or a more like reddish area. So you can use them to find the, sort of like a sweet spot for this model to make sure that it looks okay. And uh, we got back to exposure. Now I think my model is still a bit, a bit faded. So let's just, let's just give it a bit more uh, brightness. So again, this is, there's no uh, sort of golden rule for that. You have to find the right settings which work the best for you. Uh, otherwise, uh, what you could do is that even if you are not sure about what the end result should look like, if you are unsure if this is the right uh, style for you, you can of course save the model, or I mean save the image, and then you can give it uh, another to go and have another uh, try at rendering and uh, give it a different uh, end result. So if I click on save now, I can see that there's a couple of versions I did before, so you can save this as street from left and you can save it as try one and from this on you can you can uh, have this image and you can email you can email it to your clients again rendering takes some time to get uh, to get an eye for that so uh, if you understand what these sliders can do you can create the best possible end result in the least amount of time once you are done with uh, with the rendering and with the effects let's uh, discuss a couple of other things that this window can do um, you don't see that because my face is covering it, but there's an option to change the resolution for the, for the rendering. But beware, if you are in standalone rendering, in a final render, if you change this, the rendering will restart. So every time you change something in the details, you add another background and you crank up the, uh, the uh, quality to a higher level, rendering would be start from the beginning. Now, uh, we already moved to, the, to this detail step, so let's uh, discuss them, uh, discuss the content here for a second. You might be familiar with these items because this is the same thing you would see when you start rendering. So again, you can change the, uh, 
uh, the light source uh, visualization, enable artificial lights, uh, you can change the background. But again, if you change anything here, then uh, you might need to start rendering over again. Another thing you can see here is the selector for your views. Uh, all the views are, are here that you have uh, recorded. So the things that we uh, had set up before are here available. You can just switch to them and then you can make a render on them. Uh, before we go to the th uh, third tab, let's go to this DOF. This stands for uh, depth of field. Now, this might be relevant if you would have some elements of interest in the foreground because this, this, uh, this tool enables to find something which is in your focal point. So if you have, for example, you have an interior model and you have like a vase uh, in the foreground and everything in the background could be blurred out and vice versa. So this might be, this becomes interesting if you have a scene with more depth, you can just enable that and uh, certain elements would be sharper than the rest. Now let's uh, talk about the third tab, the render list. Uh, if we click on that, we see that we have familiar things here. These are the, the uh, the perspectives that we recorded. Now, why are they in this list? What is What does this tool do? Now, you can see that this render, what we saw here, not counting the afterwork, uh, took almost seven minutes to complete. So if you have uh, four or five scenes and you, you multiply that with seven minutes, it's a long time. So you don't have to, you don't want to spend that much time in front of your computer, bad for your eyes. So you need to find some kind of automated way to, to render these images without you having to be there. And that's what the what the render list actually does. Uh, the best practice for this is is that you start rendering the image, uh, quickly find a setting, stop rendering it, and then you do this with all the all the scenes over here. And then you would have the presets, and then you can just check all of them and click start, and then all the images would be rendered one after the other. This saves a tremendous amount of time. You don't have to spend too much time setting up the things. You don't have to wait for the renders to be done because they would be done on a separate window. Now, um, basically, uh, that's what rendering is all about in ArchLine. So we have, uh, we have come a long way from uh, the first lines in the DWG drawing and uh, getting all the way here. Uh, there's a couple of other things we are going to show later on, but the, but the modeling, the documentation and visual design part is, is done. If you have any questions regarding what we have showed you, you can always ask the questions down uh, in, the, in the comment section of this video. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this part and we are going to continue with some other things in later videos.